Hi, hopefully a quite a short video on just talking you through the code for the coding exercises in the workshops last week. I know some of you didn't get around to doing that, so I thought I'd post this video. So with no further ado, just as for the Fourier transform walkthrough, code, Python code walkthrough back a number of videos ago, we've got numpy and we've got matplotlib.pyplot in terms of the plotting and the various mathematical routines. The, the new module is this, is this, and we use that to integrate. The, that's got the, the functions we need to integrate. Now you might say, well, why didn't you tell us to use that? It takes a matter of a minute, really. It takes a matter of a minute on Google to type in Python integrate how or words to that effect. And this will come up. So the, the idea here is not for me to, to, to give you every single step. I will give you guidelines and certainly in the coursework, I give you a step by step recipe on how to do the, the shooting method, for example. But in terms of this, I want you to get you into the habit, or I want you to get into the habit of actually just typing in these things and looking them up for yourself. There are many ways you could do this integral. You could, for example, just sum up under the curve. You don't have to use a, um, a standard routine. But if those routines exist, and they're easy to use, and they are easy to use, as we'll see, it's best to use those routines. So we set up our variables and arrays. We've got two eigenstates. We're going to call them, uh, we're going to set up initially the first eigenstate, and we're just going to look at that. We're going to set n equal to m equal to 1. I'll change that a little bit further down the line and show you the effect. With uh, L, we'll just set that equal to 1. You can set that to whatever you like, but let's set it equal to 1. Then we've got 1,024 points, and our minimum x value is 0, and our maximum x value is L. So our wave function is defined, our eigenfunctions are defined between 0 and L, and we're going to integrate over 0 and L. This is just setting up our x-array exactly as we did in terms of the Fourier transform video, Python video. So this defines the spacing between our points, which is just x max minus x min over n, and then we set up an array to represent the x values. Now, this is slightly different. You could just set up two separate arrays, two separate one-dimensional arrays, um, and call them two different things. That would be absolutely fine. I've done something slightly different here just to get you, to introduce you into thinking about two dimensional arrays. Be a little bit um, further down the line, a few weeks time, we'll be thinking about matrix mechanics and we'll be thinking about arrays and matrices. So this is just to, to, to gradually ease us into that. So we define uh, an array. This is a two dimensional array. So what we basically have are two rows We've got a list of n values and another list of n values, and each one of those lists um, is defines our eigenfunction. And so what we can do is you can refer to, because it's two-dimensional, we can refer to the first eigenfunction by using the index 0, and in the, the second eigenfunction by using the index 1. And each one of those has 1,024 points, which is what the j-index is. And now we're establishing what our functions look like. So for j and range that, if you had a large number of eigenfunctions, for example, you wanted to include more, you could have two nested loops doing this. But we've just got two eigenfunctions, so we can just set it up like this. This defines our eigenfunction with the index of n. This defines our eigenfunction with the index of m. And then we calculate the overlap integral. So we take the product. So that product is defined in terms of the complex conjugate of one function multiplied by the other function. But in, given that these are real functions, the complex conjugate of a real function is just the real function. So we just multiply those functions together. And then the overlap integral is the integral of the product of those functions. And we use something called Simpson's rule, which is what the Simps thing is for to define that and that takes two well it takes a number of uh, variables but the two key ones and this we need to use are this array and python is clever enough to realize that because this is an array and this is an array when we, python knows that this is an array remember that each of these so you might say well where's the j gone but the important thing is by saying eigenfunction zero that says i want you to 
use the list, use the array of 1024 values that we define for eigenfunction zero. And then for eigenfunction one, similarly, it knows, Python's clever enough to know that what you mean is I want the eigen, I want the uh, row in the array that is associated with those 1024 values for eigenfunction zero or eigenfunction one. Then we calculate the overlap. So then the overlap integral, this overlap variable is, now this is a scalar, this is just a number. And that's the integration of the area under the product curve, basically. So in this case, it takes two arrays, the product, which is this, which is an array, and also the X files, which is also an array. And that gives us a single value back, which is the value of the overlap integral. And then we just print that out. So the overlap integral for our first eigenfunction n and our second eigenfunction index m is to get given by the overlap. And all I've done here is just round that up to two decimal places because otherwise Python by default prints out a ton of um, decimal places. And then I just plot everything. Um, we've got two eigenfunctions. So I just, in principle, I could do this in two separate lines. It's just as easy to do it in two separate lines. I'm just offsetting those a little bit just so we're spacing things out. And then the product is also plotted. So let's just run it. So for those two, we're now looking for eigenfunctions n is equal to m is equal to 1. So this is the first eigenstate. This is the second eigen... No, this is the first eigenstate. This is the second eigenstate. The product looks like that. Everything's normalized. So what we would expect is... Where's my window? That the overlap integral is 1. So, so what we mean by orthonormality, we've taken the product and we've integrated up, we find that's one. Now let's ch change it to n not equal to m. Let's do that. Run it again. So, this is how orthonormality, orthogonality works. So first eigenstate, n equal to one, second eigenstate, m equal to two. Product of those gives us that function, but note, so when we integrate this, the positive bits, the positive area here and the negative area together, we get zero. Let's look at a slightly more sophisticated example. Oh, let's set this to um, 21 and let's set this to 12, just as a random example. So, eigenstate n equal to 21, eigenstate 12, but, so that's what they look like. Uh, 21 eigenstate is here, it's obviously the higher frequency one, and our n equal to 12 eigenstate is here. Take the product of those and we get that, but n is not equal to m, so the integral here, again, if we just look at the area under this function, it's as positive as it is negative, and therefore our area is zero. It integrates out to zero which I hope is what our code is telling us, yes. Right, our second coding challenge was to do this, which is superposition of two eigenstates, uh, infinite potential well, and to animate that and show how it varies as a function of time. So ultimately, this is what your code should do. A Little bit more sophisticated and a little bit more involved than the previous example, but let me talk you through this. So, numpy, as usual, I did say in the um, question that CMath was a very helpful uh, module, and that allowed, that's basically allows us to handle complex numbers in Python. We have our matplotlib as standard. We also now need to, and again, I mentioned this in the question itself, also need to import uh, the animation module um, and uh, I pointed you towards a tutorial on how to do this. I've just used that tutorial myself, I must admit. And then also, again, just in terms of keeping everything um, normalized, I've also imported the same integration module as used in the last code. Okay, a few things are standard here. Um, I'm sticking to 1,024 points. I like 1,024 points. Um, nice round integer power of two. 
and set the well width equal to one. And we're going to set a, a DT. We also need a time step in terms of how regularly we're updating this. I've set that to 0.1. You have to play around with that. Why does it set it to 0.1? Because I wanted to set it up in terms of a nice smooth animation and also not to overtask the computer. Um, so there's no point getting it to calculate time steps, which are point one, so it's so slow, nothing happens. Um, and also it takes a long time to, to, to finish one cycle. So it's just a question of playing around with that experiment and a bit of trial and error. Okay, so then building on what I described for the last piece of code, we've now got a two dimensional array again with 1024 points because we've got two eigenstates and we've got to take account of those two eigenstates. We've got an array. Now, this time, however, it's not real. The, the array is not real valued in the sense that it's not real valued, it's complex valued. So then we can say, then we tell Python that it's complex valued by putting in D type is equal to complex. So it's exactly the same idea. Two arrays, two dimensional array with um, eigenstate zero and eigenstate one, just as we had in the last piece of code. But now we have to tell Python, we want you to handle complex numbers. Now we could write all that complex number handling code ourselves if we were really masochistic, but there's no point reinventing the wheel. So we um, use Python's inbuilt, or at least via this module, this library um, complex number functions. I've set this up. Now, there are other ways of doing this. I've set it up so we've got our eigenstates, but I've also declared the starting state as well of the, um, the system because we're going to evolve that starting state. So we need to have some way of, of setting that up in Python. So, but it's exactly the same idea. Two eigenstates. This is our sort of ongoing eigenstates. This is our starting eigenstate. Psi is again a complex array. But in this case, we've just got one wave function, one state of the system for every instance of time. So this just needs to be a one dimensional array. And then also we've got a phase term. Now, this is not a two dimensional uh, array. You will notice that there's only one. I haven't got brackets here and then one in 1024. This is just an array, a 1D array with two values in it, um, which we're going to use for the, the, the phase to define the phase. Okay, lin space again to define the x values. And we're going to define, first of all, define the eigenstates. So you're given in the question what the starting wave uh, function is. There are two um, eigenstates. We've got the first eigenstate. So that's why I've got for n in range 0, 2. So we've got the first eigenstate. And I've because n is equal to 1 or n equal to 2, and the loop is going from 0 to 1. I've added 1 to n here. So the first eigenstate will be for n equal to 1. The second eigenstate will be n equal to 2. And then it's just defined really as we had in the previous example, except our starting factor here is not um, root 2 over l, it's root 1 over l as given in the question. So now we sum up those. We've defined our starting eigenstates, both of them. So we sum those together to get our wave function, which is what is here. Right. So that now we've set everything up. We're at time equal to zero. We've set everything up. We've got our um, wave function x t is equal to zero, um, as defined in the, the the question. Now what we're going to do is going to evolve that. And remember what we do to evolve that is that we take each one of those eigenstates and multiply it through by a phase factor, which is e to the minus i e t over h bar, where e is the energy eigenvalue associated with that particular eigenfunction. So in this case, we've got e1 and e2. And remember that e1 and e2 are related for the infinite potential well in that E2 is four times E1. So that means that E2 is going to evolve, is going to oscillate back and forth at four times the rate of E1, as I covered in one of the previous videos in terms of the animated um, web-based, browser-based simulation I did, the back-in-the-box thing. Okay. So we set up a figure. I'm just going to call that fig. And we set up the title of that figure, time evolution of superposition states, a bit of a wordy title, it doesn't need to be that that wordy. Now this is taken directly from the tutorial 
um, I pointed you towards. So we've got now a function, animate, and that function is, um, we pass it the value of t. And what we need to do, or at least the way I did this, there are other ways, and if you've got other solutions, I'd love to hear about them. But what I did was just clear the plot every time. Now that means when I clear the plot every time, I also have to redraw the axes. And uh, that's, from some perspectives, slightly sloppy programming, programming, but what I'm aiming for here is not the most efficient code, I must admit. I'm aiming for clarity in terms of that you can follow the steps. So if you've got a more efficient way of doing this, great. Um, I'm trying to explain this without getting too tied up in the minutiae of Python programming. Let's put it that way. So what I do is, is clear the plot each time. But that's just a question of the animation. The real business end of what's going on is here. So we've got our phase factor, which is... Remember, we've got e to the minus i e uh, t over h bar. Now, I'm using units, betting our energy is equal to 1. Now, you don't have to do that, but the problem is, otherwise, if you, if you work with SI units, you're going to carry around very, very small numbers. And that's bad from a number of ex from a perspectives, particularly if you're working with very small numbers, then, what it's, then the finite precision of the computer in terms of the, the smallest value it can store, can become an issue, particularly if you're squaring those and you're getting 10 to the minus 68 if you're taking a hit bar squared off that order. So it's important to look for, for units, as I mentioned before, that are a little bit more tractable. And in this particular case, it's just a question of finding those units. What you want to do is really find um, the behavior of the system and the dynamics of the system in, in in context of, of you know units that that are easier to work with so and that's evolving in time so t is the number of the frame in the animation so if we want to animate this as a function of time we've got to take t times delta t and we've defined delta t up there i just noticed a, a mistake in this in that this should be a negative there rather than a positive i will fix that in the the, the code i've uploaded that um, it should be because our exponent is e to the minus i e t over h bar. So this should be minus i means cos minus sine when we're defining our phase factor. So that should be a negative. In terms of the overall animation, you can play around with that. You'll see it doesn't make a great deal of difference in terms of the, the dynamics apart from, in effect, we've reversed time. Um, so, but we have got a complex phase factor. Um, we've got a complex phase factor for each of the um, eigenstates, which is why the n is here. So our first eigenstate, this will be a zero. Second eigenstate, this will be a one, but then I'm adding one to it here. So n plus one. So this is just a question of conversion from array indices which start with zero for Python. We add one to those, so we get the n equal to 1 eigenstate. I hope that's clear. Please send me an email if that's not at all clear. And this is effectively taking our e to the i factor and converting it. Well, we've got to code that for in language Python understands. So we've got to give it the real part and the imaginary part. And so the real part will give it is the cost term. This is just Euler again. And the imaginary part is the sign term. And our, then we define our eigenstate as our starting eigenstate, our new eigenstate as our starting eigenstate times the value of the phase factor. And remember, the value of the phase factor is just a number. So this is just a number. So eigenstate is an array, of, which is 1,024 values long. Eigenstart is an array, which is 1,024 values long. Phi is just a number, which is just given by this uh, complex phase factor. And then, just as we did initially, we take our wave function, and our wave function is the sum, is the superposition, which all that means is a sum of those two states. Then I normalize, get the probability density, which is the absolute value of psi times the absolute value of psi. Then, which is, this is the modulus squared. Get the area under that curve using the Simpson's rule, 
that I mentioned in the last in relation to the last computing problem and then divide through that ensures that the probability density is normalized so the area under that curve will stay one and then set up the the limits of the graph um, plot the the probability density versus the x values um, and just add in the labels as I say, this is all happening in Animate, so every time it's clearing the plot, it's replotting those. Perhaps they're not the most efficient, but clear at least in terms of the code. And then we return from that, and then the function Animate, as was described in that tutorial I pointed towards, is this. We give it the figure, we give it the function, um, we tell it the, the range of the frames and the number of frames we want before it repeats. Um, we tell it the interval between those frames, and then we set repeat is equal to true, and we show the plot. Then we run it, and notice that it bang in the center of the well. That value stays fixed for reasons described in the solutions to, I believe, worksheet four, worksheet five, I can't quite remember. Okay, I hope this has been helpful. Uh, I know that was quite a sophisticated piece of programming you asked us to do with regard to this. But honestly, being able to code that, um, I would argue, teaches you a lot more about what's going on in the dynamics of quantum systems than solving n number of expectation value integrals. I'm not saying that solving those integrals isn't important. It absolutely is. And knowing the mathematical underpinnings and understanding the mathematical underpinnings is important. But being able to see this evolve in time in front of you rather than a static graph on a screen, I think is, for me at least, certainly provided key insights into just how quantum mechanical systems operate, if you'll excuse the pun. Okay, see you uh, for the synchronous session on Tuesday. I will get these videos edited and uploaded just as soon as I can. And of course, the notes as well. Uh, thank you to a couple of students who pointed out that the um, equation numbering has gone awry in a couple of places. Yes, I will fix that in chapter four um, in the version of notes, I'll, uh, the updated version of notes I'll upload. Okay, see you later. Bye.